thanks to Effie and, and the Set Ecology Society, uh, our, uh, our uh, section of the ESA. Uh, Torn and I are really thrilled to be here today and, and to give this. Um, how we're going to do it is I'm going to kind of give the boring background theory stuff um, for, I don't know, about 25 minutes maybe, and then uh, turn it over to Torin to, to actually walk you through um, examples of how to do this um, in R. And um, with that, uh, I'm going to get started because we're, uh, we've got a lot of material, as, as probably always. Um, this kind of gives you an overview of the talk, and, and um, as Krishna mentioned, um, material can be found in this, particularly the, the book on the right, which is free to download, uh, the PDF, um, and then the book on the left, if you're interested in a little bit more of the kind of background, more of the theoretical parts of it, um, there's more of that in, in, in that book as well. Um, so basically, I'm going to go through some stuff about just kind of motivating what space-time data is, some stuff about visualization, descriptive models, um, exploration, and then a little bit about dynamic models at the end. And then, as I mentioned, Torin will go through um, some R examples of the things that I present here and, and others. So, so with that, um, let me just say that, uh, you know, the thing about that's cool about space-time data is that, you know, we live in, in a complex world and with complex stuff going on all the time um, across all sorts of different scales. And so, one of the things I like about this particular slide is that when you look at, say, um, image from the Hubble Space Telescope, uh, uh, you know, co cosmological imagery, and compare that to brain cells, you can see some some obvious similarities. And I think that's the kind of cool thing about working with spatial data and and space time data in particular. And then one of the things that that I am interested in, I think. Um, those of you who are on this uh, webinar would be interested in with, with respect to, to forecasting ecological processes is that there's an interaction going on always across time and space of different scales, but then across different processes. Um, for example, sea surface temperature, where you might see El Nino signals, waves across the region of course, corresponding to El Nino, see similar structures in the cloud patterns, um, in that part of the, the uh, tropical Pacific. And then interestingly enough, you see similar patterns um, in say the phytoplankton uh, primary productivity. And, and so that's the, the key point here is that there's all these different things happening. They're all linked together and which makes it a fun thing to model. And, and so you could say, well, we've you, I know you've seen some some presentations on spatial statistics already because uh, we've we've had the pleasure of seeing that as well. And you might have seen some time series stuff. And those are great. And, and I'm a big fan of both topics, but you lose a lot if you only look at one of them. I mean, it's very hard to think of a spatial process that's not linked to time and vice versa. And so if I looked at a um, uh, gauge a, a gauge on a, on a river, on the Missouri River in this case, and I saw peaks um, over uh, flood stage, uh, that might tell me some stuff, but it doesn't really tell me the extent of the flood. And similarly, if I look at two satellite images corresponding to before and after the famous 1993 flood in the, uh, in the Missouri River, uh, you know, I see a lot, I can see the impact uh, much more clearly. And so those things together um, are really what we're interested in here, sort of the linkage between the two. So when we think about space-time, um, this isn't complete, but when I think about it, I think, what are we going to do with it? Well, we might be interested in predicting in space, uh, perhaps forecasting in time. Maybe we're interested in, in parameter inference in some sense, and we just need to account for the, the residual dependence in space and time. Maybe I want to assimilate observations um, and me mechanistic models together. Um, I might want to emulate a model, a computer model, um, so that I can um, do it much more rapidly. Or I might be interested in classification. So all sorts of things, the usual um, stuff that we're interested in. So to get started then, I want to just go through a little bit about data. And I feel like we should always be looking at the data and what are some of the things that um, we look at when we look at space-time data. Well, the first thing is to what are space-time data? And well, of course, we could have univariate data or multivariate data as usual. Um, time series part of this, you could have regularly spaced data or irregularly spaced data, continuous data, data or discrete time. Um, maybe we have events, random events, like in point processes, um, and we're actually interested in when the event happens as opposed to 
the process that's evolving. Um, and in the space context, we have what we sometimes call geostatistical data or continuous space data, where what we're measuring can happen anywhere in space. Um, lattice data means that we have data on some sort of a uh, uh, finite or countable subset of space. And maybe you have, say, for example, county data in the US or state data, uh, country level data, or maybe we have gridded data um, that comes from a model, for example. Uh, random events like point processes, we can have point processes that occur in space, uh, like craters on the moon, for example, or locations of trees in the forest. Um, those might have marks with them that tell you something about like the diameter. And then we have objects. Think, uh, for example, trajectories. Uh, animal movement is a good example of that. So all these are the types of data, and, and there's really more, and there's combinations of these, but these are kind of the basics. And so each of these has their own special way that people have tend, tended to visualize them. And the challenge with space-time data and visualization is that there's so many things happening at once. I have multivariate data. I have time and space, two dimensions of, of space. Um, and, and time, for example. And so um, we have to get creative about how we might visualize this. And so I'm just gonna give you some examples here. And if you look at the resources, you can see some other ones. Um, and data might be irregular um, in space, or as I mentioned, or, or um, lattice data. So here's an example, if you have some irregular data. Um, colors, useful, you know, plotting a symbol with colors in it. Um, the size so on the left is, is corresponding to breeding bird survey data of house finch in the, in the U.S. On the right is, is uh, maximum daily temperature. So on the left, you can see we do both the color and the size, uh, but on the right, we're just doing the color of the temperature data. Um, uh, coral cleft map is, is how we often visualize data that are irregular lattice data, like in this case, county level data in, in Missouri. Um, and that's pretty useful. I mean, obviously the color scheme makes a difference and, and one has to play with that to, to find what, what works best for them. Um, image data, uh, lattice data, regular lattice data. Um, this is what I work with most often, I would say. And, and I tend to favor image plots like the one on the bottom here. This is the sea surface temperature. This is an El Nino. But, but some people like contour plots for that kind of data. Some people like surface plots for the similar... Um, I'm not a big fan of surface plots because you sort of hide part of what you see, uh, would like to see, but um, they are striking. And so in some cases make a big difference. Um, so that's so sort of just the general um, spatial, uh, kind of plotting spatial data. Um, what about uh, data when we think about space and time together? Well, we might think about a sequence of maps like this. Um, I, this is showing the, the house finch invasion from uh, East Coast from the early 80s to uh, the, the late 1990s. And so if you look at that, you can kind of see how the, the spread is happening um, from, from East to West. Uh, one of my favorite ways to, to represent um, space-time data, in, at least in some cases, is what's called a Hofmiller plot. And what this is, is I take the spatial dimension uh, one spatial dimension, and I kind of pick an average of the other spatial dimension. So in this case, I've got longitude uh, on the x-axis, and I'm looking at uh, averages from one degree to north to one degree south and sea surface temperature. And then I plot from uh, early years to late years going down the page on the y-axis. Why I like these is because I can actually see propagation. I can see that this blue blob is actually moving um, from east to west. And I can see that this part of the um, this hotter area is kind of moving from uh, west to east through time. And so these are very useful plots. I can also see things like where there's a transition zone. Um, so it doesn't always work because it depends on the kind of data, but they're very useful plots if you've never used one before um, to get 3D information to two dimensions. And then um, I still think that animations are one of the, the best ways that we can look at, at these kind of data. And in this case, um, this is actually showing you a model from a simulated fire um, and just, just a few frames of it. And why, I'm, why I had this is because we actually built a space-time model to emulate this. Uh, it was very high dimensional um, 
geophysical fluid dynamics model. And this is the statistical model representation of it, which is can be done in a fraction of the time. But so by looking at the, the animation, I can see, oh, the general um, features present in, in, in the fire model is actually captured by our model as well. Um, so those animations I still think are, are, are super useful, um, not so much quantitatively, but certainly qualitatively to, to examine what's going on. Okay, so I know I'm moving fast here, but that's kind of, all this stuff is in, in these books and, and I just want to give you a flavor. Today is all about just giving you a brief overview of what's going on in this discipline right now. So um, some of the other things that we'd like to do is start summarizing data. You know, we visualize data and then we start thinking about some summaries of it before we build models. And so the usual things we do are, are kind of what you would do in, in any kind of statistical modeling. We might look at some empirical means, maybe some covariances, and then some specific things that are more related to space-time data, like covariograms and, and what we call empirical orthogonal functions. So here's an example of just showing empirical means, spatial means, um, where I've averaged over time. And in, in the left plot, this is temperature maximum temperature data. You can see I'm plotting this as a function of longitude, and I don't really see any structure to it. Not surprisingly, over the, over the um, central U.S., you don't see much east-west variation typically in, in long-term temperature averages. But if I look at the right side of this plot, then I'm plotting the average temperatures um, uh, against latitude. And, and now it makes perfect sense. As I have um, higher latitudes, I have colder temperatures, you know, the east, the north-south gradient of temperature in the summer. And so it, it makes perfect sense. So, so this is a good, easy summary. If I didn't know anything about the data, I would learn something here. I mean, this is no surprise because I already knew what temperature was doing, but it's a, as an example. And similarly, if I look at the empirical... Um, spatial averages, but then plot them as a function of time for this temperature. And this is the uh, uh, what we call a spaghetti plot, where I'm showing every single realization in the in kind of the, the background uh, purpley color, and then the average on the in the in the black line. Um, you can see some cool things. You can see where uh, fronts are occurring, the time periods where there's a like this cool down in August happened because there was a, a large scale kind of cold event. That, that's unusual. Whereas you see these smaller scale things are probably due to a variation that might happen just on kind of a weekly basis with, with small scale uh, mesoscale weather phenomena. And so this is um, a very simple way to get spatial and temporal information into one uh, a one dimensional plot by just doing averages. Now, more complicated stuff, we really want to start thinking about covariances of some sort uh, or correlations. And uh, we often plot empirical lag covariances or correlations between two spatial locations. And I don't, I'm not showing plots of those today, but uh, if you look at the, the two books I mentioned, they'll definitely have those and they're quite useful. Um, more typically, what we need when we start modeling though, is we need this notion of a, what's called a covariogram, which is thinking about um, what's the co covariability lagged in time and lagged in space at the same time or the same at the same moment. And, and maybe I assume something about that. Maybe I assume that direction doesn't matter, which is called isotropy. Or maybe I assume separability, which means I can consider time and space independently of each other, which is not very realistic. So these kinds of plots let me look at those things, which are gonna be important when I start thinking about modeling. So this is just what one would look like. This is showing the covariability um, as the spatial lag increases and as the time lag increases. And as typical, um, as you get further away in space or in time, the dependence decreases. And you can see that here, but it doesn't decrease in the same way. And, and this was, um, if 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 I consider this um, as a separable thing where I could think about spatial lag different from independently of time lag, uh, I could show you that this would not be appropriate. And I, I'm not going to do that here, but it's not hard to do that. And, and I have examples of that in the in the R book. Um, but this is helpful because I'm going to need this kind of function to do space time modeling later on. Uh, and the last thing, and again, I, I don't want to spend too much time on this. Uh, one of my favorite 
things to look at, especially with gridded space-time data, are what are called empirical orthogonal functions. And really what this is, is just um, principal components in space and time, where I think about the spatial location, in, the information at the spatial location as the different variables or traits like I would in a, in a typical principal component analysis. And I think about the time as the replication. And what it does then is I, the way it works is I basically calculate an empirical correlation matrix with that, a spatial, correla spatial correlation matrix averaged over time. And then I do the usual principal component decomposition. And the cool thing about this is then the loadings are, um, um, are actually spatial maps now because the traits were spatial. And, and so I can look at those as, as maps and those are called empirical orthogonal functions. And then they project onto the new variables that are made here, like in principal components, are called principal component time series because they're actually time series and they show how the data project onto those spatial maps. And what they're showing as usual with principal components is where the highest spatial variability is. And that's what these things correspond to. So this is sea surface temperature. And this is the first principal component or first EOF. And you can see this signature here that looks like an El Nino. That's where the biggest variation is in the, in the tropical um, sea surface temperature. This is associated principal component time series. And you can see places where there are peaks or valleys are where there are large El Nino or La Nina type events. Um, now, because it's um, an orthogonal decomposition, it's not gonna capture all the variation associated with El Nino. So the second principal component, which also accounts for quite a bit of variation, and it corresponds to more intense parts of the El Nino signature. And, and so it, what these things are, you know, some people treat these as basis functions. And so I think, well, I have a way to project my data onto certain spatial basis functions that I get empirically. And then these time series might be um, what I model. There's over 2000 spatial locations in this image. And I can account for about 40% of the variation of, of that with just two variables, these two time series. So that's pretty cool. So these are very useful, not only for modeling, but also for just exploration, just like in regular principal components. Uh, so a lot more discussion about that if you're interested in, in, in some of the resources I've mentioned. Okay, so moving on, let me just check the time. Uh, moving on, I wanna talk about um, a little bit about modeling. And again, we don't have a lot of time here, but there's two types of modeling that we really consider in space-time. What I would call descriptive, which is more of a covariance-based uh, way to model, uh, and dynamic, which is actually factoring in how things change through time uh, conditionally. And so this traditional uh, descriptive approach is a more of a marginal approach where I think about characterizing the variability that happens uh, in space and time to means and variance, covariance structures. Um, they're great because we can build some really nice optimal predictions um, theory, just like we can in, in spatial Krieging, for example. Um, and that's why people started doing this originally, because it was like an extension of the spatial prediction Krieging uh, literature. Uh, all I need to do is specify some sort of mean structure and covariance structure, which seems easy, but in fact, that's kind of the hard part. Um, in practice, it's great in, um, when you don't have a ton of data. If you have a ton of data, then we have to start making some compromises. And I'll talk a little bit about that here. So how does it work? Well, in case you, when you go back on these slides and you wanna focus on a little bit more, um, here's some notation. When I, when I use Z, that's an observation um, and it's gonna have a space and time associated with it. Uh, a vector is just gonna be bold. Y is going to correspond to the latent thing that I really want to predict, so it doesn't have any observational error with it. I have X's that are going to be my covariates or my uh, that I might have. Parameters are going to be thetas. I'll use brackets for distributions, and transposes will be a prime. So um, spatial prediction from a descriptive context really follows Tobler's first law of geography. Uh, or at least a spatial temporal version of it, which is everything is related to everything else, but near, nearby things in space and time are more related than distant things. And that's on average true, but of course, there are all sorts of things where that's not true. Um, 
uh, you know, we have competition or waves in the atmosphere or rivers and streams and whatnot. But but in general, this is kind of how we model things. Uh, we don't have to, but it's just traditionally how it's done. So if that's true, and I want to predict at a new location, um, say this place here, Y S naught T naught, um, time's kind of moving up the page. What I'm going to do is think, well, I'm going to basically interpolate to do that based on nearby locations. And so I'm going to take the sums of those nearby locations in time and space, and that'll be my new prediction. And that's this is what it might look like. So these are my observations. I'm going to get, build some weights here to do the averaging or do this interpolation with. And with the first law of geography, then probably the closer locations are to the ones that I want to predict at, they'll probably get a bigger weight. So the cool thing is, is that we know that we can do this in all sorts of different ways, but the optimal way to do it is to actually minimize the mean squared error associated between y and, and this sum on the right-hand side and find what those weights are. And if you do that, it helps to start with a model like this, where kind of like if you're familiar with state space modeling and time series, I'm gonna model the, the, the data in terms of a true process and some observation error. And then the true process is going to have a trend associated with it, like an X beta term, and then a space-time dependent process. And that space-time dependent process is going to follow what's called a Gaussian process, which is just like a multivariate normal, but it works as it's a function. It works in, in any locations in space and time. Or, um, so everything's going to be functional. In practice, it'll it'll um, I only am ever interested in a finite set of stuff, and so it falls back into a multivariate normal distribution eventually. So this is what that predict predictor would look like, the predictive distribution of Y given all the observations Z. And so I'm going to break this down for you in a second, but I want to point out that this beta hat here lists just a generalized least squares estimate and where the dependence happens based on the covariance of the Zs, which is the covariance of Y plus the covariance of the, of the um, measurement error. I want you to pay attention to the fact that there is this matrix inverse going on. So you could imagine if, if the dimension of my data in space and time is really large, that's going to be a problem. Okay. But what is what this means is that this predictor is really simple because it starts off with just a GLS regression estimate, which is what we would have if we didn't pay attention to the space-time dependence. And then it's going to take the residuals from the data and that same fit. And it's going to take those residuals and it's going to adjust this um, GLS estimate um, with these residuals and this stuff here, um, the C naught prime C inverse, those are going to correspond to the weights. Okay, and, and so what's cool then is that the weights are actually functions of the covariance between the place I want to predict at and all the places that I have data and then the variance. And so this is why I need this notion of a Gaussian process. I need to be able to specify the covariance between any two places in space and time, even ones I don't have um, observations at. So I will actually need to specify a function for this. But once I do this, this is optimal. This has turned out to be the best prediction I can do that's linear and unbiased. So people like it. And so this is an example of it with, with Midwest um, temperature data. And so in this particular case, I had no data at this time, but I had data at these locations for the times before and after. And so you can see this is the prediction and it's kind of cool. You can see that there's this cold front and this cold front is moving kind of uh, like this kind of from um, uh, northeast, uh, sorry, northwest to, to southeast. And, and then it kind of flips around like this. And, and, it, and it captures that. We get that. It looks great. And then more importantly, this is, shows the uncertainty that I get from that, which was in the formula on the previous page. And you can see, of course, I, I don't, um, uh, what the whole point of this is, is that I can see I have a lot more uncertainty here when I didn't have the data, but it's still a good prediction. And so I have not only the prediction, but I have a sense of the uncertainty associated with that prediction. Okay. So that's what, um, why people like it. Unfortunately, um, if I've got, uh, well, we don't really know what the covariance function is that I need for that Gaussian process. So I have to specify it somehow. And there's some tricks to like help decide that. But honestly, 
most space-time covariance functions are not very realistic um, because the processes that are going on are way more complicated and uh, can be easily specified by just a simple covariance. Um, so they're not very um, uh, realistic, but they might be good enough. Uh, but yet we still have to take this matrix inverse order in cube observations, and that can be a problem. So all the last 10 years or 15 years have, have seen a lot of research into working with these things in high dimensions. And, and there's sort of three way, main ways to do it. Neighbor-based methods, nearest neighbor Gaussian processes, or sometimes called Vecchio approximations. There's methods for that. There's stochastic partial differential equation methods, which is, if you might've heard of INLA, INLA does that, uh, integrated nested Laplace approximation approaches. And there are basis function approaches to do this. Um, and so I won't go into that, but if we were gonna spend a lot of time on this, we would go into each of those methods and, and kind of learn what, what their strengths and weaknesses are. Um, there are different advantages and disadvantages to both or to all three of them. Um, but they all would, would work in high dimensions and there's software available for it. Um, and then just as a quick note, I could also use these spatial um, descriptive processes as, for example, um, random components of a, of a uh, log Gaussian Cox process, a point, a spatial temporal point process. And I might want to use Markov random fields in other cases. And so I could do that. And I just don't have time to talk about that today. But um, there's um, a lot of information out there, and, and there's a couple of books here that I'll have in the references if you're interested in, in that a little bit more. Some other information, this is again for you when you go back through this, and, and Torin will talk about some of this, um, some, some uh, packages that do this, uh, what I've just talked about. Um, there are also packages that will do this for non-Gaussian data, and much like a generalized linear uh, mixed model or generalized um, additive model. And there's plenty of software that's getting better all the time um, and uh, very powerful methods. But, but again, computational in high dimensions, these things can be kind of problematic. Okay, uh, this is just an example showing a, a, a Carolina Wren um, reading bird survey counts in Missouri fit with a GAM model with underlying spatial, um, uh, spatial temporal field. Okay, I don't have a ton of time left. I want to give Torn time, but I want to just mention a little bit about dynamic models. Okay, and this is what I really, my main interest is in, in specifying, um, instead of this descriptive model approach where you have to specify covariances, rather think about how a spatial field evolves through time. And by doing that, it's a conditional approach. Um, it's more, I think, appropriate for scientific modeling, because that's kind of how we think about processes. It's more like the etiology of the process is how, how the spatial stuff is changing through time. And, and there's advantages and disadvantages again. Um, I, I like this approach because I think it's more scientific in a sense. Um, it also makes it easier to, to establish causality. You know, why is something happening as opposed to just modeling the fact that there's a relationship? Um, it allows us to put a priori information in, like we might know a priori why the process might evolve differently than another process, and so we could specify that accordingly. Um, and it accounts for the fact explicitly that there's interaction going on ac across location or across scale. And I feel like that's really important for space-time processes. And so just because I don't want to dominate this anymore, I'm going to... Um, just mention one thing about these kind of models. Um, and, and it's best to think about them in sort of three levels. There's the observation part of the model, which again, we're just relating how we have the spatial vector might correspond how to the data that we are to the real world process. And maybe this is a GLM type model, or maybe it's just a nonlinear transformation, or maybe it just there's, there's no function here, it's just an additive Gaussian model. And then the second stage though, is that we think about this conditional model for the evolution of Y given the previous values of Y. And this is this dynamic part of the model. So this usually a Markovian dependence, and it's the specification of this part of the model where all the fun is. And it's like, well, we could just model this like they do in time series, but in reality, the dimensions are so high that we need to make um, 
uh, like uh, simplifications with how this might evolve. And we can do that often by all sorts of ways to do it, but we can model the parameters that control these evolutions as processes themselves. We could put in you know, mechanistic information directly into this model. And so there's some more in the slides about this, and, and I've written a lot about it in, in, in the two books I mentioned. Um, and I feel like uh, it is, it is a, a direction to go, but it's also the more niche-based modeling. There's, there's less available, although there are some software packages. Here's some of them that do it. Um, as here was an example. One of the first ones I did way back was to model the evolution of El Nino. Um, so a seven month forecast here, forecasting from March to uh, October. And, you know, how, how are you going to get the evolution of this large El Nino? And a dynamic model can do that for you. And, um, and these are some of the packages that are out there that, that can do it now. Um, most of the work that I've done have been, I built these models from scratch because they're kind of don't quite fit into any of these software packages. But I still think there's the, these packages are getting better all the time, and I feel like they're still quite useful. So that's really all I wanted to say. Um, there's other stuff that we could talk about here, nonlinear models, um, for sure, um, and including now more and more neural-based models to help do this kind of stuff, um, and 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 more complicated kind of simulation-based um, models like uh, uh, cellular automata models or agent-based models as well. Um, but I'm not going to. I'm going to turn it over to Torin now and and let you see these references. And by, by um, uh, I guess, at any point, if you have questions after this webinar and you want to chat with me, I'm more than happy to do that. Thanks so much. Okay. So I will take over. Like Chris has been mentioning, um, we're sort of just giving you a taste of what's out there. Um, Chris's slides are already on the, I think I shared the wrong thing, the um, GitHub. So those are available. Let me make sure I share my whole desktop. Okay. All right, here we go. Okay. So I'm going to go through just a few examples. Um, let's see. Yeah, we'll have enough time. And all in R, um, this is on the GitHub. So the main package that might be new to you, um, I don't think I use ggmap, gstat, space time, um, sp is a classic spatial object package in R. And so a lot of the space time um, package here just builds on those spatial objects that if you have worked um, with that before, you'll be familiar with. Um, okay, so the first little demo is on uh, visualization. So we spent a lot of time on that, tried to grab some data that might be uh, applicable to this group. So I actually went on the FE forecasting challenge page and downloaded um, the phenology data. So this is data on the, there's red and green um, chromatic coordinates. And if you are just getting into the forecasting challenge, right, you might want to um, plot it. And the two things you might notice as we go through this is there's sort of um, two ways you can have your data structured to work with it with these packages. One is sort of long data. So I have this um, in here. Let me just pull it up. So what I mean by long is we have the spatial and time um, information in one row. Okay, and then everything is just row after row after row. Um, this will let you use things like ggplot. Um, if you're doing, we're going to do a generalized additive model example, a generalized linear model. Um, those packages, you can build up your space time, maybe basis functions and use the model fitting with your long data. So here is an example. We're going to um, just plot the time series for six random sites. So you can see uh, lots of seasonality, um, right, repeated features over time. 
uh, and then some right there's different surveying efforts across the location. So if you are using this, you'll probably need um, quite a bit of data cleaning. Okay, so time series. Now we're going to, let's look at the field sites. So the field sites were in a, another object. And uh, ggplot has this borders function um, to cre quickly get basic borders uh, around the world, US. So here we have the world borders. This will be country borders. And we can do some quick referencing to get it to look nice. So we have these um, locations, mostly in the continental US. We have Puerto Rico, Hawaii, and Alaska. So NEON, right, is a North American organization. Um, they have pretty broad spread. OK. OK. So next, we're going to look at, oh, this is not, uh, the median date, we will look at the um, GCC measurement on that date. In order to get to match up the location to the measurement, we have to join on the site ID. Okay, so all of this is sort of some, as I mentioned, data cleaning, joining information, from our phenology data to our phenology site. For ggplot to have, if you're doing color and size, you can get one legend by making sure that the color and size scales have the same number of breaks. So here I'm doing um, manual, calculating the breaks at some quantiles of our observations. Okay. And then, um, again, I'm starting now. I'm going to, let me just run and show this. So here is the what our goal was. We have the states, continental US. Now we have color and size scale with one legend for the GCC. So as I mentioned, um, in order to achieve a unified scale, you have to specify the same breaks and the same name of for the legend, for the color, and here size. And then I've also added this guides for the theme. Um, and so now we can start to see some spatial patterns. This is February 9th. So um, in these regions along the West Coast, down in the Southeast, uh, this GCC, right, this is phenology of plants. So this is related to green up. Um, so this is maybe er very, very early in spring. We might be seeing some um, green up in these regions of the continental U.S. All right. Okay. Okay, and my, I'm going to introduce my favorite package for animations. Um, I've been using this since I was a doctoral student with um, Dr. Weichel. And this is, once you know ggplot, animations are easy. You can use gganimate. Okay, I'm going to do a subset because um, animations, essentially, when you make them, you're building up from individual plots. And so... If you start with a small subset and you can test how long it takes for it to render your animation. So here we're subsetting to um, April to October in 2023. The only difference is for you add a layer here that specifies how you want your animation to transition. And this is a variable in your data set. So what do I mean by that? I mean, um, right, in my sub, I have this is daytime. So my animation is going to transition. The frames will transition between daytime. And when you are getting into this, if you look at the help pages for these transition layers, it will tell you um, some information on computed label variables that you can use in your animation to have meaningful titles. So here in my title, this is um, syntax is called gluing. So I'm gluing in the frame time. So this has to match up 
to the help page um, from the transition layer. Okay, uh, I like to save this as an object because usually you'll want to write your animation um, somewhere. Okay, I'm gonna show a couple of things. So if I just print in the console, it will show me, right, rendering how long it takes. It takes a few seconds and it should pop up in your viewer. While this is going, I'll also say, I prefer when I'm first exploring my data for the first time. So not for like a presentation, not to be showy. Um, I like to make the number of frames sort of transition exactly corresponding to how many observations I have in my data set. This takes a lot longer to render. I'm not gonna run this, but I have it saved on my computer. Um, and so, here, this is much slower. So this might be something you just use and sit with if you're trying to um, first investigate this data. You can see it's kind of slow enough that you as a human, you can catch um, how these are transitioning. This will take a few minutes. So I recommend if, if you are maybe following along to just hold off um, on running these three lines of code. And if you wanna save, it's just like GG save, you can use anim save. Um, I usually use .gif, that's easy for me, I'm on a Mac, um, and it just saves the last rendered animation, or you can specify the object. Um, anyway, help pages for that. Okay, so that's animation. So those are sort of our marginal, where we inspected the temporal, um, the time series for different sites uh, spatially, for one time point. Now we can start looking at those averages. So my favorite way this is, is to, again, keep using tidyverse, um, summarize. So I'm grouping by the spatial location and I'm summarizing then over time. Um, there's some manipulation here to keep the uh, attributes accord that correspond to the latitude and longitude here. Um, so I don't have to rejoin. Okay. The As I mentioned before, the space time is not completely dense, meaning that some we saw in the time series plot, some of the locations started surveying later um, and it wasn't at every point. So I'm also sort of keeping track of how many observations there were. Okay. So this is going to plot over the latitude and longitude. So as Chris mentioned um, in his slides, he had the temperature here. Remember we have Puerto Rico, Alaska, and Hawaii, but we can see maybe some groups, right? So this area here, we have GCC longitude. This is sort of the longitude. Um, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but on the right half, Right, is sort of the longitudes that correspond to the continental U.S. and you see do see maybe some increase um, from west to east, I believe. Okay, and then here is then for the latitude, our continental U.S. latitudes now are maybe in the middle. Um, again, maybe there's some um, relationship there. But yeah, we're just exploring. We see some different groups um, patterns. And you maybe in your ultimate model, you handle the continental US differently than um, not continental. Okay, then we can average over time here. And now I've added, okay, if there weren't any observations in that, that time period, let's uh, filter that out. Okay, so, but again, I'm using my summarize. Now I'm grouping by the date time. Um, so for each day time, let's get the average over space. Okay. And here I am doing a little bit. There is a long time from 2016 to 2024. So I sort of broke it up by each year um, to try to see a little bit uh, more what's going on. Otherwise you get sort of this very dense caterpillar type <laughs> plot. Um, so this is sort of a spaghetti plot. This data might not work as well 
uh, from the data we saw on the slides may be a little dense, but if we zoom in on one year, um, you can see a little bit more. There seems to be, again, some seasonality here that maybe is um, consistent across the years, but that's something that you would want to consider in your forecasting. If you are doing the challenge here in 2016, this is just there was only one site. So the mean is the observation. Okay. Well, those are our um, descriptive visualizations. I'm going to keep going now into some of the modeling. Um, so that data set, the pheno phenology data set, as I mentioned, it's this long data frame. Um, now for the next example, we're going to actually be using a spatial object. So this is STFDF. This is from the space-time package. Okay, this is spatial temporal data for full space-time grid with uh, data frame. So the DF means data frame. You have a measurement on that space-time grid. Okay, so this is provided. This, so this is July maximum temperatures. This is the data from the slide. So it might seem a little um, familiar. So as I mentioned, this is the STFDF. The dimensions look like an array. So we have 328 spatial dimensions, 31 time dimensions with six variables. So six measurements on that grid. Uh, you should definitely take a look at indexing on this help page. There are many ways to index into this object. So if we look at um, the first spatial location, we have right, time, and now here's our temperature, temperature. And we can get the spatial extent. You can use this boundary box function if you're thinking about um, spatial extents. So this is in latitude and longitude. And now we're going to fit some variograms. So the variogram function here, this will just do an empirical variogram. So we're not assuming, as Chris mentioned, a specific model form, a parametric form. We have some fixed effects. So from the slides, we saw that temperature has this relationship with latitude. And then we give the temporal lags for... Um, what time lags do we want to calculate the co uh, the covariance? And then this is just saying if a point is a thousand kilometers away, essentially um, they're not close enough to be considered in calculating the covariance. These again, should be informed by your data visualizations, your data. Um, exploration. Okay. And this empirical variogram we need when we fit now the forms, the other forms. So the, the separable is the one that we mentioned from the slides. Um, we fit those variograms with this function, variogram space time. Okay. Some of these specifications, we need to know what is the variance of our original data. So this right here, the variance of the temperature data across all space time is 60. Okay, so we want to specify um, some of our variance components on the same order. So you'll see these sills and joint sills, that sort of means uh, variance. Nugget means very like instantaneous variance. Um, range, so you have to do a little bit of calculation. This is 400 kilometers. Remember, we have uh, latitude, longitude. So 400 kilometers over that boundary box, uh, pretty short. Okay, one, this is one day. Separable, we specify then a marginal space and a marginal time model, right? The separation, they get multiplied together to give you the joint. Um, Separate, they're both exponential. This is just uh, some form. You can think of it like, kind of like a Gaussian kernel. Um, and then to fit, so this is all specifying the model here. We call this function variogram space time. Whatever model you put here, uh, let me pull up the 
help page. So whatever model you specify in space time model will determine whether you need to specify a space, time, or joint. So here, separable space time. The fit it, we need to give the empirical variogram that we uh, had above, and then now we give this form. And we can print. So here I'm printing. These are essentially the values that it estimated. So the, so let me see here. First is space. So the nugget for space has a partial sill of 0.05 and uh, et cetera. The range, it ended up estimating that the range, so essentially um, there's a lot of dependence within this range and not much um, outside of the range here as well for time, a lot of dependence within two days and maybe not much um, beyond that. There are a lot of models you can pick. You might be wondering, how do you choose? Well, you can fit a couple of models here. We'll do another one metric. This is a joint space-time variogram. So we're specifying now a joint structure, again, exponential. And then we need to give it this sort of space-time scaling. Um, this roughly says that 150 in our spatial domain domain, so 150 kilometers, is roughly on the same order um, as our time domain, which is one day. Um, so again, make sure you inspect your um, object and understand how, what resolution are you measuring in time and in space. Okay, and then it's the same setup, fit, and now we have metric. Um, on the same order here, the range, about 400 kilometers. When we fit a couple of them, we can get the mean squared error and decide based on that, what we wanna use in our Gaussian process. Okay, so the separable variogram has a mean squared error of 1.4 and the metric two. Okay. We can also plot them to compare them. These are all the objects, so these objects, space-time variogram model, so all of these plots are the methods for space-time variogram model. The default is sort of this gridded, so how we read this is the bottom here is sort of at zero time lag and zero spatial lag. We have um, high dependence. Uh, what? Okay. And then it sort of decays as we, we go away from zero, zero. Okay, and you can see inseparable, right? It's sort of just multiplied. So it's um, kind of pair, well, these are gridded, but it's sort of concentric circles as you move around. And then here on metric, we can get a little bit different shapes because it's we're specifying joint. Um, another way to view this is if we say map equals false, we can see profiles. So again, at lag zero is this black one. So at lag zero for time, we have this shape in space. So you can think of the variogram as sort of inverse of the um, variance. So as you go away in distance, you're getting uh, less dependence in space. Okay, and again, this is multiplied, so these lines are sort of, um, they're the same shape. Here, again, on metric, we can get different shapes here. Uh, let's see, I'll just do one more before we go on to our next. Um, this one, if you do all equals true, then I can see my sample. So this is my original imperial variogram. This is just the sample, like if you calculate the sample variance without um, a model, right? So sample variogram, these two have specific model forms that they take. Okay. So Krieging, then you choose one of those variograms, those forms, and um, we'll pick the one that had the best MSC. Here I am, if I want to Krieg, meaning predict in space, I need to set up the object I want to predict on. So I can use expand.grid, um, and I need to create a time grid. And here's just plotting. So this is my spatial grid that I am predicting over based on this 
code, um, make sure here that you match the coordinate reference system of um, your data that you used to fit the model. Otherwise the predict function won't work. So need to have matching coordinate reference systems here. This is how you access. If you've worked with spatial objects in R before, a lot of times the accessors are this at symbol. Okay, so the coordinate reference is instead of the dollar sign. So that's a little bit more into R that um, we don't have time to go into today, but the coordinate reference system is latitude and longitude. Okay, and this is just to ensure it matches. Uh, we're creating then that SDF object here with our space time grid. And then I will just go through here, Krieging space time. We set up our same. Uh, mean effects, so temperature is an intercept and latitude. Our data, we're removing, as we saw in the slides, we removed one day so we could see how the model performed. This is corresponds to July 14th. And we're using our separable variogram. This one had the lowest MSE. Here we specify the data we want to predict in the same function, so maybe a little bit different than what you might be used to with sort of LM and GLM having a separate predict. This is all in here in the same call. So Krieg, space time. Um, this takes a, a couple minutes, but I already have it run, so I will just stop it because we don't have time for that. Um, we can look at the plots. So this will generate the same plots from the slides where we have. Now we're using space time plot. Um, this is the method for our Krieg object. Uh, let me see here. This is not stopped. Oh, no. <laughs> All right. I... Okay, that's fine. Okay, so here, these are um, pre-produced from the slide. So the Spatial field prediction, you can plot with ST plot on the Krieged object. The ar uh, arguments are similar to base plotting. We get out the standard error and plot it as well. So again, we took out this day from the data we used to fit the model and we Krieged, which is um, similar to interpolation in space and time. Okay, all right. Now, I don't have much time. I will just read this last code, maybe go through it. So the last thing is um, a BBS example. This is another example of, so this is an example of using long data. So we have our data as a data frame. We create um, basis tensors from the space and time. These are the names in the data. So, T, lat, and long, those correspond to um, variables in our data. Then we can specify we have two dimensions of space, one in time. This is setting up about 50 knots in space, 10 in time. And we just fit with a GAM here. So you might be familiar with GAMs from previous FE, FE webinars. And again, this might be more of the familiar structure you are if you're used to working with R um, models and predict. Right, so, uh, okay. And I will probably, I think I can stop there. This is all available to you and I'm happy to add, answer more questions. Um, I wanna make sure there's enough time. So I'll just stop there. Thank you so much. Uh, let's see, I mean, I think now it's Q&A session. Uh, INLA SPD models and sometimes the spatial effects can seems to be too flexible and capture all the variance that ideally would be assigned to coherence. Lucy, you want to take that? Um, yeah, I, I, I guess um, <laughs> that that can happen. Um, you know, it's sort of, I guess it's overfitting, right? Just like any other um, random effects model can do if you're not careful. Um, you know, the, the Krieging type models are, are less prone to that because, um, by their very nature, they're trying to estimate the actual amount of variation associated with the, 
um, the leftover, you know, non-mean part of the model. But the, yeah, the, the basis function approaches and, and inla-based approaches, which are essentially a basis function approach, uh, can do that. Um, but regularization can help. Um, I, I don't, again, I don't typically use that package because I feel like it's hard to tune to your particular problem. But if you can, it can be quite efficient. So I'm sorry I don't have a great answer for that, but but I do think one has to be care just as careful here as you would be any other type of um, modeling with with the trade-offs between fixed effects and random effects. One has to be pretty careful, and and I think we have to regularize in high dimensions for sure here. Hey, thank you so much. The second question is also for, also for Chris. So do you have recommendations for EOF style calculation for non-graded data? The yeah. other, uh, like lattice point processes and tra trajectory based calculation, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. Um, yeah, so, so you don't have to have gridded data to do EOF based calculations. Um, you know, I can certainly do it with point based data. Um, the the and, and it'll all work because you'll still get your uh, decomposition of the um, covariance matrix. If you the problem is is if you have um, missing data or if you know different uh, spatial locations at different times, then then you would have to come up with some sort of pre pre gridding kind of approach to it, which you could do through some sort of a um, perhaps kernel based pre estimation. And then do the the EOF decomposition, and then kind of map back. Otherwise, one one there are some more formal ways to actually build in the area of influence associated with each spatial location, and kind of build the um, uh, flexible way to do that empirical decomposition. If anybody's actually interested in that, I can I can uh, uh, provide some references to that um, approach. Frankly. I don't think it typically makes that big a difference. I think that the pre-gridding seems to work about as well. But if you want to do it formally, or I don't want to do it all in one one big model. Uh, it is possible to do it that way, especially if you take a Bayesian approach to the problem. Hey, thank you so much. Our next question is for Torrent. So will GG animate, can you, you with this package, can you change the time between transitions between time points to slow down how fast the image change? Yes, so there's a couple of options. There's um, in the animate, you can specify the number of frames per second, so FPS, and then that would be the one I would start with. And then there might be another option um, if you look on the help page. But yeah, if you just slow down, so put less frames per second, then it will be slower. Yeah. Hey, sounds good. Thank you. And uh, maybe this question can be for both of you. So in what instances do we use linear or nonlinear models in spatial temporal modeling? Um, yeah, I'll, I'll take a crack at that one. Um, that actually kind of is a topic of, of great interest to me. Um, as usual, if you, if you think about nonlinear modeling in general, um, you know, the challenge with nonlinear modeling is there's so there's an infinite number of nonlinear structures that you could pick. And so uh, it makes it challenging to have a general framework. My thinking is, is if you know why you might have a nonlinear process and you know something about the functionality of that or the mechanisms, then I feel like we have some, some model tools that can help us with that. Um, and so it's probably better to take the nonlinear model and actually, you know, build it as a nonlinear model. Linear models, though, are are incredibly flexible, especially if you allow the parameters that control the linear model to change with time, which is another kind of easy way to get nonlinear type behavior from a from a linear model structure. So that's another option. And then the third is um, increasingly, as we see more hybrid models that are sort of neural models, um, neural network models that um, that can also handle nonlinear time dependence as well. Um, I think that's that's 
pretty cool, but it's also challenging sometimes to to interpret what those might mean. Um, but I feel like we're we're making a lot of progress in that direction right now. So I think that's going to be part of the future. But I don't think I don't think you should ever discount the the fact that linear models can be quite flexible in space and time. And even model, even a classic linear model like the vector AR one type linear model can accommodate. Uh, transient growth, which is like like brief periods of highly almost nonlinear behavior, and then yet they're still stationary type models. So the if you model them a, a, appropriately, if you give enough flexibility to the to the linear structure, it can still do that. Um, hey, thank you so much. That's a great answer. And uh, the next question that would would be the final question on this poll everywhere. Uh, so what what are the key differences between regular and irregular spatial temporal data? Yeah, I, I can take it. Yeah. So um the notation of regular and irregular refers well in time, right? It's like are you sampling at the same change in time? Um, and I guess in space, you can also think of it like that. Is it the same distance in space? So you can make a grid. Um, yeah. And then irregular is sort of this, the space or time locations are sort of unstru unstructured. Or, or not equal, like counties, right? There's still some structure, but they're not equal areas. They're not. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. So uh, let's see, there's a couple of more questions coming. Um, so what are the recommendations if the data is sparse in time or the, or the time series is too short? So they ask what kind of techniques can be used to accommodate those kind of things. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's a great question. Um, so I feel like with, uh, we often, at least the kind of data that I work with, it's, it's usually the case that there's way less time replicates than there are spatial locations which does present a problem for like full estimation. Um, I think what that means is you have to be a lot more careful about how much dependence you wanna build in the spatial part of the model and how much interaction you want. So in other words, may, maybe you have to give up a little bit of, of flexibility um, because you're sort of regularizing because you don't have enough data in, in time. Um, as, a, as a side example, I didn't talk about it here, but um, this is a problem that one faces often with, with trying to fit complex um, uh, neural network models like LSTM type uh, recurrent neural networks is that they, they require a ton of data and time. And yet we don't often have that, especially in ecological data, right? That's that's pretty rare. Even a long, long-term long ecological data is, is not long by the standards of, of some time series analyses. But there are uh, methods that, that Torin and I and others have played with um, that are called reservoir computing methods that actually the the weights that correspond to the neural network are not estimated but they're they're um, randomly generated and one only estimates the output weights and so those can then you can actually build this really complex kind of nonlinear structure uh, when you don't have a lot of time replicates because you you can't that way you can you don't have to estimate as many parameters so I think as we learn from that, there are going to be some extra way, extra methods that come out that we can kind of build space-time models with sort of random weights or random parameters, um, and uh, you know, stay tuned. But I think I think there's going to be some some changes coming down the pike in that regard. Hey, thank you very much. Another question is for a typical UF analysis, what might be the variables included in a PCA? A uh, good question. So um, when when I do it, it's usually a bunch of spatial location uh, data at spatial locations, like the sea surface temperature across a bunch of locations. Um, so so think about any kind of data that, like like for example, the the green up data that the Torin presented. Um, if you did EOF on that, it would be those green up data at every spatial location would be the traits, and then then the time replicates would be the 
um, the same, you know, would be time. You can do EOF analysis the other way. You can make the the um, uh, the basis function time and then the replicates are space. And you can do that too. It just, and people have done that. It's just not as, um, I guess, scientific in some sense, but there's no reason that you couldn't do that. Okay, hey, sounds good. Uh, thank you. And uh, do any of these packages or tools apply to linear network spatial data like streams and rivers? That's the question, yeah. Yeah, um, I'm not sure. Chris, do you know? Do you have any examples in your book of uh, We don't, rivers? but um, you know, some some of them would work if you could but you'd have to accept the fact that your dependence is, is sort of operating, um, you know, you'd be assuming it's operating in both directions when it might not be. But I think I think the packages that, that uh, Jay Verhoof and Aaron Peterson have worked out with river networks, I think they've done that, I'm not for sure I've done that with space, and I think they're extending that into space-time now. So I think there are going, to, if there aren't now, they're soon going to be, some some nice packages available for for stream networks and that kind of thing and non Euclidean data in general um, so far you you could do things like creaking on it like uh, but you'd have to pick sort of basis functions that might uh, uh, work with that but there's been certainly data on the sphere uh, uh, methods that work on the sphere so so yeah if you if you Google around there are definitely some things out there that could be done for that. Okay, hey, sounds good. Thank you. The other question is on the package SP. So right right now, the SP is commonly used in the R script. Will will it be easy to do this analysis with the new package called SF? That's a great question. So um, the the this this listener is, is ahead of the curve because for sure, I think SP is going to be um, superseded pretty quickly with with SF um, and I and and stars as well. And I think that um, most of the packages are going to start moving in that direction. And, and um, I know, I know, in our book, uh, Space Time with our book, um, you know, we're in the process of discussing a revision, and we'll we'll definitely be moving to use SF and and stars for that as well. So I think that's that is definitely the future. It, there's just, it's just better. Okay, sounds good. I think there's one final question on the poem layer. So. Uh, it's about Gaussian process. So Gaussian process is very useful as they provide a measure of uncertainty, but this uncertainty relies on the assumption structure of the covariance to be right, which might not be the case. Do you have any tips to deal with this assumption? Like um, they are assuming the structure of covariance must be to be right to use the Gaussian process. I guess that's the question. Yeah, yeah, great question. Um, this, is, this is indeed, I think, one of the big challenges of of space-time modeling, you know, from a descriptive point, is that you have to specify a, a covariance function that you almost are sure is incorrect. Um, remarkably, uh, the predictions are pretty robust to that. Um, you know, it's hard to find examples where where it really matters as much as you might think. Where where I have found that it matters is when I have to uh, predict into a a uh, sparse area uh, where there's not much data, either in time or space, then then it can matter quite a bit. But if you have fairly dense data, it's probably not going to matter too much. And so this is why I favor a dynamic approach because I'd rather build my dependence and why I, why I favor basis functions because with basis functions, you can kind of get complex marginal dependence back um, and, and through sort of conditional modeling and it seems to work better. Kind of like the the when you think about linear mixed models and and why you might take a conditional approach versus a marginal approach and it's usually because you can build more complex things with a conditional approach but but that being said again if you've got fairly dense data it it doesn't matter as much as as you might think it would um with the assumptions on the gp hey sounds good i think we got all the questions answered and uh, thank you so much. Thank you to again for your help on the other wonderful seminar and the instructions on our package.